Hi, this is Brad Constantine, and this is a podcast recording of the Doctrine and Covenants of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Even though this is not an official recording of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, every effort has been made to be as doctrinally and historically accurate as possible. Every day a new section of the Doctrine and Covenants will be released. I hope that you'll visit this often and be able to share this uh, with your friends. Thank you. Hi, and welcome back to this uh, Doctrine and Covenants podcast. We are in section 109 today. <clears throat> yes, 109. I'm going to read the heading first. This is about the temple dedication in Kirtland. Prayer offered at the dedication of the temple at Kirtland, Ohio, March the 27th, 1836. According to the prophet's written statement, this prayer was given to him by revelation. Often we think of this as just a prayer, but it was actually revealed to him what he should say and what he should write. Uh, this is the pattern that uh, has been used for all temple dedications since this. This dedication occurred on March the 27th, 1836, which was also Palm Sunday. In preparation for the dedication of the Kirtland Temple, the Prophet Joseph Smith, Sidney Rigdon, and Oliver Cowdery, as well as Warren A. Cowdery and Warren Parrish, who acted as scribes for the Prophet, met the day previous to the dedication to make arrangements for the Solemn Assembly. This business occupied the remainder of the day. During this meeting, the dedicatory prayer for the temple was written down. It is likely that Warren A. Cowdery and uh, Warren Parrish recorded the prayer because they served the prophet as his scribes and personal secretaries. Oliver Cowdery recorded in his journal, This day our school did not keep. We prepared for the dedication of the Lord's house. I met in the president's room President J. Smith, Jr., Sidney Rigdon, my brother Warren A. Cowdery, and Elder W. Parrish, and assisted in writing a prayer for the dedication of the house. The procedure of writing the temple dedication prayer has continued in the church today. Now the day of dedication had come. The people assembled early, full of joy and gratitude, and they were not disappointed in their expectations. The manifestations of the divine presence were such as to leave no room in the minds of the true saints for doubt concerning the nature of the work in which they were engaged. Heber C. Kimball relates that during the ceremonies of the dedication, an angel appeared, probably Peter, and sat near Joseph Smith Sr. and Frederick G. Williams so that they had a fair view of his person. He was tall, had black eyes and white hair, wore a garment extending to near his ankles, and had sandals on his feet. He was sent, President Kimball says, as a messenger to accept of the dedication. A few days afterwards, a solemn assembly was held in accordance with a commandment received, and blessings were given. While these things were being attended to, Heber C. Kimball says, The beloved disciple John was seen in our midst by the prophet Joseph, Oliver Cowdery, and others. On the 6th of April, a meeting was held which was prolonged into the night. On this occasion, the spirit of prophecy was poured out upon the saints, and many in the congregation saw tongues of fire upon some of those present, while to others angels appeared. This, President Kimball says, continued several days and was attended by a marvelous spirit of prophecy. Every man's mouth was full of prophesying, and for a number of days and weeks our time was spent in visiting from house to house, administering bread and wine, and pronouncing blessings upon each other to that degree, that from the external appearances one would have supposed that the last days had truly come, in which the, the Spirit of the Lord was poured out upon all flesh." Nor were the saints the only ones who were aware of supernatural manifestations at this time. Elder George A. Smith rose to prophesy while a, a noise was heard like a sound of a rushing wind. All the congregation arose and many began to speak in tongues and prophesy. And then people of the neighborhood came running together, hearing an unusual sound within and seeing a bright light like a pillar of fire resting upon the temple, and were astonished at what was taking place. This continued until the meeting closed at 11 p.m. All right, uh, a little bit more. The meeting was from 9 in the morning until 4 o'clock in the afternoon with only one 15 to 20 minute inter intermission. This is, again, the dedication of the temple. Some who attended this solemn assembly testified that an angel was present and accepted the proceedings. Others were more specific and declared that the Savior was present and that the Apostle Peter had come to accept the dedication. Verse 1. Now, as I mentioned, uh, this is a, there was a pattern for this, and also Solomon's temple was similar to this. In fact, the wording in the first verse is taken from 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 23. Thanks be to, my, to thy name, O Lord God of Israel, who keepest covenant, and showest mercy unto thy servants, who walk uprightly before thee with all their hearts. This verse is similar to the verse in the dedicatory prayer offered by Solomon on that temple. 
Verse 2, thou, the dedicatory prayer is addressed to the Father, as all prayers should be. It is addressed to the one whose original command it was that the house be built, which direction had been revealed to the builders by the Son, through whom all revelation comes. Thou who hast commanded thy servants to build a house to thy name in this place, Kirtland, and now, be, and now thou beholdest, O Lord, that thy servants have done according to thy commandment. And now we ask thee, Holy Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of thy bosom, in whose name alone salvation can be administered to the children of men, we ask thee, O Lord, to accept of this house the workmanship of the hands of us, thy servants, which thou didst command us to build. For thou knowest that we have done this according, or we have done this work through great tribulation, and out of poverty we have given of our substance to build a house to thy name, that the Son of Man might have a place to manifest himself to his people. It took about three and a half years to build the temple. Sacrifice brings forth the blessings of heaven. Hmm, sounds like a part of a hymn. Verse 6, And as thou hast said in a revelation given to us, calling us thy friends, saying, Call, thou solemn, call, thy, call your solemn assembly, as I have commanded you. The solemn assembly to whom this reference was made was the school of the prophets, where the elders were, to, were would be instructed and endowed with power from on high. The dedication of a temple is also a solemn assembly, as noted in Doctrine and Covenants 109, verse 10. The pattern of such assemblies would follow that of the Lord's people in ancient times. Solemn assemblies included the gathering of his servants in a state of ritual purity for sacred purposes and holy convocations, such as the festival of unleavened bread, or the eighth day of the festival of booths, Heber C. Kimball said, We had been commanded to prepare ourselves for a solemn assembly. At length, the time arrived for this assembly to meet, previous to which the prophet Joseph exhorted the elders to solemnize their minds by casting away every evil from them in thought, word, and deed, and to let their hearts become sanctified, because they need not expect a blessing from God without being duly prepared for it, for the Holy Ghost would not dwell in unholy temples. This meeting took place soon after the house of the Lord had been dedicated. When the prophet Joseph had finished the endowments of the first presidency, the twelve and the presiding bishops, the first presidency presided to lay hands upon each one of them to seal and confirm the anointing, and at the close of each blessing, the whole of the quorums responded to it with a loud shout of Hosanna, Hosanna, etc. While these things were being attended to, the beloved disciple John was seen in our midst by the prophet Joseph, Oliver Cowdery, and others. Verse 7, And as all have not faith, seek ye diligently, and teach one another words of wisdom, yea, seek ye out of the best books, words of wisdom, seek learning, even by study and also by faith. Organize yourselves, prepare every needful thing, and establish a house, even a house of prayer, a house of fasting, a house of faith, a house of learning, a house of glory, a house of order, a house of God. As our bodies are temples, these scriptures also mean that we should live our lives as mentioned here. We should pray, fast, have faith, learn, be organized, and so on. Verse 9, that your incomings may be in the name of the Lord, that your outgoings may be in the name of the Lord, that all your salutations may be in the name of the Lord, with uplifted hands unto the Most High. And now, Holy Father, we ask thee to assist us, thy people, with thy grace in calling our solemn assembly, that it may be done to thine honor and to thy divine acceptance, and in a manner that we have been found worthy, that we may be found worthy in thy sight to secure a fulfillment of the promises which thou hast made unto us, thy people, in the revelations given unto us that thy glory may rest down upon thy people and upon this thy house, which we now dedicate to thee, that it may be sanctified and consecrated to be holy, and that thy holy presence may be continually in this house, and that all people who shall enter upon the threshold of the Lord's house may feel thy power and feel constrained to acknowledge that thou hast sanctified it and that it is thy house a place of thy holiness. And do thou grant, Holy Father, that thou also, sh all, all those who shall worship in this house, may be taught words of wisdom out of the best books, and that they may seek learning, even by study and also by faith, as thou hast said, and that they may grow up in thee and receive a fullness of the Holy Ghost, and be organized according to thy laws, and be prepared to obtain every needful thing, and that this house may be a house of prayer, a house of fasting, a house of faith, a house of glory, a house of God, even thy house, that all the incomings of thy people into this house may be in the name of the Lord, that all their outgoings from this house may be in the name of the Lord, and that all their salutations may be in the name of the Lord, with holy hands uplifted to the Most High, and that no unclean thing shall be permitted to come into thy house to pollute it, 
Those who participated in the ordinances performed in the temple in Kirtland did so by invitation. These rites were performed on the third floor of the temple. It was not this area that was polluted by apostates who sought to depose the prophet. Their activities took place in the assembly room on the main floor, which was open to the public. Notwithstanding, their actions were sufficient to offend the spirit of the Lord and pollute this, his house. Similarly, the Nauvoo temple was built with the idea that the lower floors of the temple would be available for public meetings and activities. Ordinances were performed in the upper rooms or attic where those who desired to participate in the temple ritual were required to first pass through an examination area or room of which there were two, presumably one, of, one for men and the other for women. It was only after temples were built in the territory of Utah that recommends signed by priesthood leaders were required of those desiring to enter the temple. That was by Joseph Feely McConkie. Verse 21, And when the, thy people transgress any of them, they may speedily repent and return unto thee and find favor in thy sight and be restored to the blessings which thou hast, had, which thou hast ordained to be poured out upon those who shall reverence thee in thy house. And we ask thee, Holy Father, that thy servants may go forth from this house armed with thy power, and that thy name may be upon them, and the glory round about them, and thine angels have charge over them. In the waters of baptism we covenant to take upon ourselves the name of Christ. We renew that covenant when we partake of the sacrament. We take that name upon us in the, in the anointing associated with the temple endowment. The Greek word of the word anointed is Christos, or Christ. For Christ to place his name upon someone is for him to identify them as his. Thus, those bearing his name are rightfully endowed with his power and authority. Their aim, or their arm, the Lord said, shall be my arm, and I will be their shield and their buckler, and I will gird up their loins, and they shall fight manfully for me, and their enemies shall be under their feet, and I will let fall the sword in their behalf, and by the fire of mine indignation will I preserve them. Do we have guardian angels? There's a question for you. To those who, receive, who have received the Melchizedek priesthood, the Lord said, I have given the heavenly hosts and mine angels charge concerning you. And again he said, And whoso receiveth you, there will I be also, for I will go before your face. I will be on your right hand and on your left, and my spirit shall be in your hearts, and mine angels round about you to bear you up. Angels are our associates, explained Heber C. Kimball. They are with us and round about us and watch over us and take care of us and lead us and guide us and administer to our wants in their ministry and in their holy calling unto which they are appointed. However, none of this should be construed to mean that individuals are assigned guardian angels with the sole responsibility of following us around, silent notes taking, which is not good doctrine. Such a thought is demeaning to both the living and the dead. It demeans the living in the assumption that they need constant watching, a divine babysitter, as it were. It demeans the dead in the assumption that they have no greater work or labor to do. That simply is not the case. Were it so, we would be left to wonder why why we had been given the companionship of the Holy Ghost and a blessing of protection as part of the endowment. Undoubtedly, John, John A. Witso said, Undoubtedly, angels often guard us from, from accidents and harm, from temptation and sin. They may properly be spoken of as guardian angels. Many people have borne and may bear testimony to the, to the guidance and protection that they have received from sources beyond their natural vision. Without the, without the help that we receive from the constant presence of the Holy Spirit and from possibly holy angels, the difficulties of life would be greatly multiplied. The common belief, however, that to every person born into the world is assigned a guardian angel to be with that person constantly is not supported by available evidence. It is a very comforting thought, but at present without proof of its correctness. An angel may be a guardian angel, though he come only as a sign to give us, give us special help. In fact, the constant presence of the Holy Spirit would seem to make such a constant angelic companionship unnecessary. So we don't have guardian angels per se, but occasionally they may come to give us help or guidance or comfort or peace or message or whatever. Verse 23, And from this place they may bear exceedingly great and glorious tidings in truth unto the ends of the earth, that they may know that this is thy work, and that thou hast put forth thy hand to fulfill that which thou hast spoken by the mouths of the prophets concerning the last days. We ask thee, Holy Father, to establish the people that shall worship and honorably hold a name and standing in this thy house to all generations and for eternity. A blessing to temple recommend holders. Verse 25, that no weapon formed against them shall prosper, that he who diggeth a pit for them shall fall into the same himself. 
No unhallowed hand can stop the work of God from progressing. Persecution may rage, mobs may combine, armies may assemble, calumny may defame, but the truth of God will go forth nobly, boldly, and independently until it has penetrated every continent and visited every clime, swept over the country, and sounded in every ear till the purposes of God shall be accomplished and the great Jehovah shall say the work is done. The work is done. Verse 26, that no combination of wickedness shall have power to rise up and, and prevail over thy people upon whom thy name shall be put in this house. And if any people shall rise against this people, that thine anger be kindled against them. And if they shall smite this people, thou wilt smite them. Thou wilt fight for thy people as thou didst in the day of battle, that they may be delivered from the hands of all their enemies. We ask thee, Holy Father, to confound and astonish and to bring to shame and confusion all those who have spread lying reports abroad over the world against thy servants or servants, if, if they will not repent when the everlasting gospel shall be proclaimed in their ears and that all their works may be brought to naught and be swept away by the hail and by the judgments which thou wilt send upon them in, mine, in thine anger, that there may be an end to lyings and slanders against thy people. For thou knowest, O Lord, that thy servants have been innocent before thee and bearing record of thy name, for which they have suffered these things. Therefore we plead before thee for a full and complete deliverance from under this yoke. Break it off, O Lord, break it off from the neck from the necks of thy servants, by thy power, that we may rise up in the midst of this generation and do thy work. O Jehovah, have mercy upon this people, and as all men sin, forgive the transgressions of thy people, and let them be blotted out forever. Let the anointing of thy ministers be sealed upon them with power from on high. Preparatory to the anticipated outpouring of the Spirit at the dedication of the temple, the prophet and the first elders were washed and anointed. Joseph Smith records as follows, On the 21st of January, 1836, about 3 o'clock p.m., I dismissed the school and the presidency retired to the attic story of the printing office, where we attended the ordinance of washing our bodies in pure water. We also perfumed our bodies and our heads in the name of the Lord. At early candlelight, I met with the presidency at the West Schoolroom in the temple to attend to the ordinance of anointing our heads with holy oil. Also, the councils of Kirtland and Zion met in the two adjoining rooms and waited in prayer while we attended to the ordinance. I took the oil in my left hand, Father Smith being seated behind, before me, and the remainder of the presidency encircled him round about, and then stretched out, stretch our right hands towards heaven, and blessed the oil, and consecrated it in the name of Jesus Christ. We then laid our hands upon our aged Father Smith, and invoked the blessings of heaven. I then anointed his head with the consecrated oil, and sealed many blessings upon him. The presidency then in turn laid their hands upon his head, beginning at the oldest until they had all laid their hands upon him, and pronounced such blessings upon his head as the Lord put in, into their hearts, all blessing him to be our patriarch, to anoint our heads and attend to all the duties that pertain to that office. The presidency then took the seat in their turn, according to their age, beginning at the oldest, and received their anointing and blessing under the hands of Father Smith. And in my turn, my father anointed my head. During the weeks that preceded the dedication of the temple, others of the brethren participated in the biblical ritual of washing and anointing. And that was from uh, Joseph Philly McConkie. Uh, verse, 20, verse 36, Let it be fulfilled upon them as upon those of the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, let the gift of tongues be poured out upon thy, thy people, even cloven tongues as of fire, and the interpretation thereof. And let thy house be filled as with a rushing mighty wind with thy glory. This was fulfilled the next week. The prophet recorded that following the closing hymn and benediction at the dedicatory service, President Brigham Young gave a short address in tongues, and David W. Patton interpreted and gave a short exhortation in tongues himself, after which I blessed the congregation in the name of the Lord, and the assembly dispersed a little past four o'clock. Having manifested the most quiet demeanor during the whole exercise, I met the quorums in the evening and instructed them respecting the ordinance of washing of feet, which they were to attend to on Wednesday following, and gave them instructions in relation to the spirit of prophecy and called upon the congregation to speak and not to fear to prophesy good concerning the saints. For if you prophesy the falling of these hills and the rising of the valleys, the downfall of the enemies of Zion and the rising of the kingdom of God, it shall come to pass. Do not quench the spirit, for the first one that opens his mouth shall receive the spirit of prophecy. 
Brother George A. Smith arose and began to prophesy when a noise was heard like the sound of a rushing mighty wind, which filled the temple, and all the congregation simultaneously arose, being moved upon by an invisible power. Many began to speak in tongues and prophesy. Others saw glorious visions, and I beheld the temple was filled with angels, which fact I declared to the congregation." The people of the neighborhood came running together, hearing an unusual sound within, and seeing a bright light like a pillar of fire resting upon the temple, and were astonished at what was taking place. This continued until the meeting closed at 11 p.m. The Pentecostal season continued for weeks after the dedication of the temple. The prophet Joseph Smith recorded a week later, I left the meeting in the charge of the twelve and retired about nine o'clock in the evening. The brethren continued exhorting, prophesying, and speaking in tongues until five o'clock in the morning. The Savior made his appearance to some, while angels ministered to others, and it was Pentecost and an endowment indeed long to be remembered, for the sound shall go forth from this place into all the world, and the occurrences of this day shall be handed down upon the pages of sacred history to all generations as the day of Pentecost, so shall this day be, re be numbered and celebrated as a year of jubilee and time of rejoicing to the saints of the Most High God. Verse 38, put upon thy servants the testimony of the covenant that when they go out and proclaim thy word, they may seal up the law and prepare the hearts of thy saints for all those judgments that are about to be that are about to send in thy wrath upon the inhabitants of the earth because of their transgressions, that thy people may not faint in the day of trouble. And whatsoever city thy servants shall enter, and the people in that city, of that city receive their testimony, let thy peace and thy salvation be upon that city, that they may gather out of that city the righteous, that they may come forth to Zion and to her stakes. Bruce R. McConkie said, The law of gathering as given to us has varied to meet the needs of an ever-growing church that one day will have dominion over all the earth. In 1830, the saints were commanded to assemble in one place. How could it have been otherwise? They were told to assemble together at the Ohio and to go forth to Zion in the western countries. In 1833, they were told to gather in the Zion of Missouri until the day cometh when there is found no more room for them. And then I have other places which I have appointed unto them, saith the Lord, and they shall be called stakes for the curtains of the strength of Zion. They were to worship the Lord in holy places. In the revealed prayer dedicating the Kirtland Temple, the prophet importuned for the righteous that they may come forth to Zion and to her stakes, the places of thine appointment, with songs of everlasting joy. In 1838, the Lord spoke of the gathering together upon the land of Zion and upon her stakes. In 1844, the prophetic word claimed the whole of America is Zion itself from north to south and is described by the prophets who declare that it is the Zion where the mountain of the Lord sh should be and that it should be in the center of the land. We now have stakes of Zion in many nations in Europe and Asia and South America and upon the islands of the sea. Before the Lord comes, there will be stakes in all lands and among all peoples. Any portion of the surface of the earth that is organized into a stake of Zion, a city of holiness, as it were, becomes a part of Zion. A stake of Zion is a part of Zion. It is just that simple. And every stake becomes the place of gathering for the saints who live in the area involved. Verse 40, And unto, until this be accomplished, let not thy judgments fall upon that city. And whatsoever city thy servants shall enter, and the people of that city receive not the testimony of thy servants, and thy servants warn them to save themselves from this untoward generation, let it be, the, let it be upon that city according to that which thou hast spoken by the mouths of thy prophets. But deliver thou, o, Je o Jehovah, we beseech thee, thy servants, from their hands, and cleanse them from their blood. O Lord, we delight not in the destruction of our fellow men. Their souls are precious before thee. But, that, but the word must be fulfilled. Help thy servants to say with thy grace, assisting them, thy will be done, O Lord, and not ours. We know that thou hast spoken by the mouth of thy prophets terrible things concerning the wicked in the last days, that thou wilt pour out thy judgments without measure. Therefore, O Lord, deliver thy people from the calamity of the wicked, enable thy servants to seal up the law and bind up the testimony that they may be prepared against the day of, of burning." We ask thee, Holy Father, to remember those who have been driven by the inhabitants of Jackson County, Missouri, from the lands of their inheritance, and break off, O Lord, this yoke of affliction that has been put upon them. Thou knowest, O Lord, that they have been 
greatly oppressed and afflicted by wicked men, and our hearts flow out with sorrow because of their grievous burdens. O Lord, how long wilt thou suffer this people to beat or to bear this affliction, and the cries of their innocent ones to ascend up into thine ears, and their blood come upon come up in testimony before thee, and not make a display of their tes- of thy testimony in their behalf? Have mercy, O Lord, upon the wicked mob who have driven thy people, that they may cease to spoil, that they may repent of their sins, if repentance is to be found. But if they will not, make bare thine arm, O Lord, and redeem that which thou didst appoint a Zion unto thy people. On the 29th of November, 1843, in the city of Nauvoo, when reviewing in the presence of a number of brethren the course taken by Missouri against the saints, the prophet said, They shall be oppressed as they have oppressed us, not by Mormons, but by others in power. They shall drink a drink, offering the bitterest dregs, not from the Mormons, but from a mightier source than themselves. God shall curse them. On one occasion, General Donovan caused the sheriff of the county to bring Joseph Smith from the prison to his law office for the purpose of consultation about his defense. During Smith's presence in the office, a resident of Jackson County, Missouri, came in for the purpose of paying a fee which was due by him to the firm of Donovan and Baldwin and offered in payment a tract of land in Jackson County. Donovan told him that his partner, Mr. Baldwin, was absent at the moment, but as soon as he had an opportunity, he would consult with him and decide about the matter. When the Jackson County man retired, Joseph Smith, who had overheard the conversation, addressed General Donovan about about it as follows. Donovan, I advise you not to take Jackson County land in payment of the debt. God's wrath hangs over Jackson County. God's people have been ruthlessly driven from it, and you will ha- you will live to see the day when it will be visited by fire and sword. The Lord of hosts will sweep it from the, with the besom of destruction. The fields and farms and houses will be destroyed, and only the chimneys will be left to mark the desolation. During the Civil War, these prophecies were fulfilled, and Missouri had a scene of widespread terrible destruction. A detailed discussion of these, discu- of these destructions is in the comprehensive history of the church. Verse 52, And if it cannot be otherwise, that the cause of thy people may not fail... Before thee may thine anger be kindled and thine indignation fall upon them, that they may be wasted away, both root and branch, from under heaven. But inasmuch as they will repent, thou art gracious and merciful, and wilt turn away thy wrath when thou lookest upon the face of thine anointed. Repentance is a rescuing, not a dour doctrine. It is available to the gross sinner as well as to the almighty or to the already good individual striving for incremental improvement. That was by Neil A. Maxwell. Verse 54. Have mercy, O Lord, upon all the nations of the earth. Have mercy upon the rulers of our land. May those principles which were so honorably and nobly defended, namely the constitution of our land, by our fathers be established forever. America is the Lord's base of operations. It will be from America that the gospel will go forth to other nations. The constitution will go to other nations as a beacon. Our nation cannot be destroyed because this is where the church goes, uh, sends missionaries from. Verse 55, remember the kings, the princes, the nobles, and the great ones of the earth, and all people, and the churches, all the poor, the needy, and afflicted ones of the earth, that their hearts may be softened when thy servants shall go out from thy house, O Jehovah, to bear testimony of thy name, that their prejudices may give way before the truth, and thy people may obtain favor in the sight of all. that all the ends of the earth may know that we, thy servants, have heard thy voice, and that thou hast sent us, that from among all these thy servants the sons of Jacob may gather out the righteous to build a holy city to thy name, as thou hast commanded them. We ask thee to appoint unto Zion other stakes besides this one which thou hast appointed, that the gathering of thy people may roll on in great power and majesty, that thy work may be cut short in righteousness." The saints of latter days are commanded to preach repentance to the world and to invite them to come unto Christ. Those who hearken to the message of the restoration are commanded to gather to the stakes of Zion before the wicked are destroyed. For I, the Almighty, have laid my hands upon the nations to scourge them for their wickedness, and plagues shall go forth, and they shall not be taken from the earth until I have completed my work, which shall be cut short in righteousness until all shall know me who remains." As the prophesied destruction of the last days gets closer, the Lord will prosper the preaching of the gospel to all nations. Doors now locked to our missionaries will be opened. The Lord's work will be hastened by the blessing that he bestows upon the earth that all might know the truth. The Lord's work being cut short in righteousness will happen according to a divinely predetermined timetable. 
Verse 60, Now these words, O Lord, we have spoken before thee concerning the revelations and commandments which thou hast given unto us, who are, in, who are identified with the Gentiles. As used in the Bible, the word Gentile means nation, a collective body. It is used in the same manner in the Book of Mormon. As a Jew is a Jewish na national, so is a Gentile, a citizen of a Gentile nation. Thus, Joseph Smith, a pure-blooded Israelite, is referred to as a Gentile. And the gospel, it is, pro it is prophesied, will be restored in a Gentile nation. By this definition, Latter-day Saints are Israelites by descent, but Gentile by culture. Any nation that does not have prophets at its head, Revelation as its constitution, and the Messiah as its king, is a Gentile nation. Verse 61, But thou knowest that thou hast a great love for the children of Jacob, who have been scattered upon the mountains for a long time in a cloudy and dark day. We therefore ask thee to have mercy upon the children of Jacob, that Jerusalem from this hour may begin to be redeemed, and the yoke of bondage may begin to be broken off from the house of David, and the children of, Tr of Judah may begin, to be may begin to return to the lands which thou didst give to Abraham their father. <clears throat> As part of the promises of the Lord to be fulfilled before the coming of the Son of Man, the prophet Joseph Smith taught that the tribe of Judah will return to old Jerusalem. In this inspired prayer dedicating the Kirtland Temple, the prophet was moved upon by the Holy Ghost to ask that the long-awaited day of Judah's return to Jerusalem be hastened. Jerusalem had not been under Jewish control since the Roman destruction of the city of the holy city in 70 AD the lord covenanted with abraham that the lord that the land of palestine was to be given to him and his seed after him forever preparations for that promise to be fulfilled were enacted with the gathering of the jewish remnant to palestine and the establishment of the nation of israel following world war 2 the keys for gathering judah to jerusalem were restored by moses to the prophet joseph smith and oliver cowdery as part of the keys of the gathering of israel in 1841, under the direction of the prophet Joseph Smith, Elder Orson Hyde traveled to Palestine and dedicated the land of Israel for the gathering of the Jews. He knelt on the Mount of Olives on, to the east of the city and dedicated the land for this purpose. Concerning the return of the Jews to their ancient homeland, he prayed, let the large ships of the nations bring them from the distant isles and let kings become their nursing fathers and queens their motherly font with motherly fineness motherly fondness, wipe the tear of sorrow from their eye. Thou, O Lord, did move once upon the heart of Cyrus to show favor unto Jerusalem and her children. Do thou now also be pleased to inspire the hearts of kings and the powers of the earth to look with a friendly eye towards this place and with a desire to see thy righteousness or thy righteous purposes executed in, re in relation thereto. Let them know that it is thy good pleasure to restore the kingdom unto Israel, raise up Jerusalem as its capital, and constitute her people, a distinct nation and government, with David thy servant, even a descendant from the loins of ancient David, to be their king. Christ, when he returns in glory as the promised David of the millennial kingdom, will claim his right to reign over the house of Israel, including Judah. Verse 65. And cause that the remnants of Jacob, who have been cursed and smitten because of their transgression, be, co be converted from their wild and savage condition to the fullness of the everlasting gospel. This verse refers to the descendants of Lehi, identified with the Indian nations of North America. They bore the curse of their ancestors, who rejected the fullness of the gospel and had been smitten by the Gentiles that came to the Americas from across the Atlantic Ocean. Because of apostasy, they had no knowledge of the Holy, go Holy One of Israel, even though they are descendants of the house of Israel. They have been promised that in the last days they will be restored to a knowledge of the true Messiah, believe in his gospel, and blossom as a rose. Verse 66, That they may lay down their weapons of bloodshed and cease their rebellions, and may all the scattered remnants of Israel who have been driven to the ends of the earth come to a knowledge of the truth, believe in the Messiah, and be redeemed from oppression, and rejoice before thee. O Lord, remember thy servant Joseph Smith, Jr., and all his afflictions and persecutions, how he has covenanted with Jehovah and vowed to thee, O mighty God of Jacob, and the commandments which thou hast given unto him, and that he, have, that he hath sincerely striven to do thy will. Have mercy, O Lord, upon his wife and children, that they may be exalted in thy presence and preserved by thy fostering hand. Have mercy upon all their immediate connections, that their prejudices may be broken up and swept away as with a flood, that they may be co converted and redeemed with Israel, and know that thou art God. Remember, O Lord, thy presidents, even all the presidents of thy church, that thy right hand may, ex may exalt them with all their families and their immediate connections, that their names may be perpetuated and had in, re in everlasting remembrance from generation to generation." 
This reference is not to those who have succeeded Joseph Smith in the office of president of the church, but rather to those who stood with him in the presidency of the church at that time, and those who presided in the presidency of the two stakes of Zion that had been organized by that point in time. Verse 72, remember all thy church, O Lord, with all their families and all their immediate connections, with all their sick and afflicted ones, with all the poor and meek of the earth, that the kingdom which thou hast set up without hands may become a great mountain and fill the whole earth, that thy church may come forth out of the wilderness of darkness and shine forth fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners. The church is likened to a mighty army that has come to reclaim the earth with its rightful king, for its rightful king. Verse 74, And be adorned as a bride for that day when thou shalt unveil the heavens and cause the mountains to flow down at thy presence, and the valleys to be exalted, the rough places made smooth, that thy glory may fill the earth. Elder Bussar McConkie said, Knowing, as we do from Latter-day Revelation, that the islands and continents were once joined in one landmass and will yet again be joined, we find new meaning in allusions and comments found in the ancient scriptures. As part of a description of the second coming, John tells us, And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. In connection with the greatest earthquake for the ages, John says, And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. Also in a second coming setting, John speaks of the voice of the Lord as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. This is the identical language used by the Lord in telling Joseph Smith that the mountains and valleys shall be not found, that the great deep, apparently the Atlantic Ocean, will be driven back into the north countries and the islands shall become one land. The voice of many waters and of the great thunder could well be the thunder, be the thunderous surging of a whole ocean moving earth moving half an earth's distance from where it now is. And all of this gives deep meaning to John's account, which says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more, there was no more sea. The apparent meaning of this is that the sea or ocean that separates the continents will cease to be, for their great land masses will be joined together again. Parley P. Pratt said, But in the resurrection which now approaches, and in connection with the glorious coming of Jesus Christ, the earth will undergo a change in its physical features, climate, soil, productions, and in its political, moral, and spiritual government. Its mountains will be leveled, its valleys exalted, its swamps and and sickly places will be drained and become healthy, while its burning deserts and its frigid polar regions will be redeemed and become temperate and fruitful. I wonder if uh, when Jesus comes to the Mount of Olives to the Jews uh, that in that earthquake which divides the Mount of Olives in half, I wonder if that's the beginning of the earthquake that brings all the continents back together. I don't know. I'm just wondering. Verse 75, that when the trump shall sound for the dead, we shall be caught up in the cloud to meet thee, that we may ever be with the Lord, that our garments may be pure, that we may be clothed upon with robes of righteousness, with palms in our hands, and crowns of glory upon our heads, and reap eternal joy with all our sufferings, for all our sufferings. The palm leaf is a symbol of victory and peace. The crowns represent those that reign as kings and queens over their posterity in eternity. They have been married in the new and everlasting covenant, and it is sealed upon them by the Holy Spirit of promise. They shall inherit thrones, kingdoms, principalities, and powers. Verse 77, O Lord God Almighty, hear us in these our petitions, and answer us from heaven thy holy habitation, where thou sittest enthroned with glory, honor, power, majesty, might, dominion, truth, justice, judgment, mercy, and an infinity of fullness from everlasting to everlasting. O hear, O hear, O hear, O Lord, and answer these petitions, and accept the dedication of this house unto thee, the work of our hands, which we have built unto thy name, and also this church to put upon it thy name, and help us by the power of thy Spirit, that we may mingle our voices with those bright shining seraphs around thy throne, seraphs or angels, with acclamations of praise, singing Hosanna. The word Hosanna is of Hebrew origin, meaning literally, save now, or save we pray, or save we beseech thee, and is of both a chant of praise and glory to God and an entreaty for his blessings. At the dedication of the Kirtland Temple, a pattern for all subsequent temple dedications, the proceedings of the day were sealed uh, by shouting Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to God and the Lamb three times, sealing it each time with Amen, Amen, and Amen. Uh, Continuing the end of the verse, singing Hosanna, to God and the Lamb. 
William W. Phelps wrote a dedicatory hymn for this occasion, The Spirit of God Like a Fire is Burning, which has been sung at all Latter-day Temple dedications. The words of the first verse and chorus express the sentiments of the dedicatory prayer and are familiar to Latter-day Saints. The fifth verse, which is particularly fitting for a temple dedication, is no longer no longer sung. Will wash and be washed, and will and with an, and with oil be anointed, with all not not omitting the washing of feet. For he that receiveth his penny appointed, must surely be clean at the harvest of wheat. That was uh, the last verse that we don't usually sing. This day among Christians was celebrated the day when Christ rode into Jerusalem upon a donkey when the people shouted Hosanna. As I mentioned before, this was Palm Sunday. Verse 80, And let these thine anointed ones be clothed with salvation, and thy saints shout aloud for joy. Amen and amen. I bear testimony that these things are true, that this dedicatory prayer is uh, the pattern that we use for all dedicatory prayers, for all temple dedications today. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Talk to you later. See you next time. Bye.